speaker, Michael Hogan, um, has been the commissioner of the Office of Mental Health in New York State uh, since uh, 2007. Uh, he's been reappointed uh, recently as well. Uh, and the New York State Office of Mental Health is a big, is a big organization, like $5 billion of a public mental health system serving uh, over 600,000 uh, people annually. Uh, Dr. Hogan has served as director of the Ohio Department of Mental Health from 1991 to 2007, and he was the commissioner of the Connecticut Department of, of Mental Health uh, earlier than that. He chaired the President's New Freedom uh, Commission on Mental Health in uh, early 2000s, and was appointed as the first behavioral health representative on the board of the Joint Commission in 2007, and as a member of the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention uh, in 2010. Uh, he also, before I retired, was my boss in New York State. I worked for Office of Mental Health for 30 years. And I retired and say, how can it be? I look so young. No. Uh, but it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Hogan. Please welcome him. Thank you. thank you, Tony. And thank you, Richard. That was very nice. And we're going to go from the sublime, in a way, to I don't know what, but uh, back to the mental health uh, uh, policy world. Um, now, I was intrigued. Uh, in this event for uh, two reasons that were, uh, you know, sort of an approach avoidance thing for me. One was the idea of trying to talk for just 15 minutes, like not so much. But then the fact that there are no questions, uh, I was like all over. So <laughs> that's a joke. Here we are. So uh, I've been really struck in uh, uh, recent times. It's, it's been in my head so much I can't get it out. This uh, supposed Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. Oh my God. And I was so struck by it that I went and looked it up and uh, discovered, according to Wikipedia, that it's actually not Chinese, but probably of British origins. And there are three curses that uh, are uh, relevant in progressive severity. So if you really want to be after somebody, first, may live in interesting times. Well, we certainly are. The, the second curse is, may your wishes come true. <laughs> and so this is relevant to us, as I think of the events of the last few years. So many of us fought for so long for mental health parity, and then for the notion of health insurance coverage for all or almost all, that the factor of uh, mental health parity legislation to the Affordable Care Act makes it seem like all of our wishes come true. And then, oh my God, leading to the third uh, and worst uh, curse of all, uh, may you come to the attention, there are actually two versions of this, may you come to the attention of powerful people or the worst one of all, may you come to the attention of the government. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are, and it occurs to me that with these forces unleashed, uh, there is a new, sometimes spoken, sometimes unspoken mandate uh, for all of us, summed up in the word integration. And I have this thought that's running through my mind that I can't get away from, of is this integration thing going to turn out better or worse than deinstitutionalization? So this is what I want to think uh, through with you uh, a little bit uh, about. First, integration is everywhere these days. It's implicit in all the alphabet soup of new models, the patient-centered medical care, the accountable care organization, health homes. Everywhere is this idea of, uh, of integration. There's an integration advisory council that CQA has established, and the National Council has got an institute focused on, uh, on integration. So I think surely it's, uh, uh, it's before us. It, it makes it sort of a heady time Maybe, in a way, like a previous heady time, heady time for about 50 years ago, think about it, President Kennedy and the Community Mental Health Centers Act, 1963. Next year is the 50th uh, anniversary um, of all that. The big idea then was the institutionalization. The big idea now is <coughs> integration. Are we going to do any better this time around? So I start by going backwards to look a little bit about what was the uh, actual story the, this notion that those who don't uh, learn from the past are condemned to, uh, uh, to repeat it. Well, what can we learn from the past? Well, then, like now, the goal was laudable. You know, getting people out of institutions, although I think it's interesting, <coughs> there was something wrong with that goal in that the word we used to describe it focused on what we were trying to get away from as opposed to what we were trying to get uh, to. Integration maybe is a little better in that regard. It says where we're going. But something certainly that was true then and remains true now and will probably also always be true is that the energy, the power, if you will, in healthcare is not with us. 
The power sits in the mainstream, and that's always been a core attention uh, in mental health, whether it's President Kennedy and the Community Mental Health Centers Act, followed then by Medicare and Medicaid, and oh my God, you know, this little program is uh, overwhelmed. But we can go all the way back to the middle of the 19th century when Dorothea Dix, after getting established an asylum in every state east of the Mississippi, convinced the Congress to pass land-grant legislation leading to the building of asylums throughout the country, promptly vetoed by President Pierce as uh, you know, an extension of federal government's interests that uh, was just too great. Uh, it seems to me an attitude that has persisted ever since with the federal government. And then even when we have what was maybe the high watermark of the federal government's involvement with President uh, Carter and the Mental Health Systems Act, Reagan comes in, uh, in his budget message, he essentially eviscerates the, uh, the whole thing. So this notion of how we are not, we're leaders, but we don't lead by control in this environment certainly applies to us uh, today. If we look at the forces of integration and try to deconstruct that in just a second, uh, what do we mean by it? Uh, I'm sort of struck in a sense that integration seems to be more or less powerful the lower you go down the food chain. The one part of integration that I think everybody in the mainstream clearly understands is they want the PMPM. The plans all want to integrate the money. They're all clear about that. Now the conversations may not go much further than, you know, show us the money. But everybody's for integration at that, uh, at that level. If we go to the front line where people get care, the integration message ain't quite so strong. If we think, for example, about current patterns of care for depression, you walk into your GP's office with depression, you have a 50-50 chance of getting a diagnosis, and if you get a diagnosis, you have a 50-50 chance of getting a minimally adequate course of treatment. Or with children, how else can we explain that half the kids on stimulant meds don't have ADHD, and half the kids with ADHD get no treatment whatsoever? So the mainstream is not quite ready, perhaps without our help, to uh, pull this off. Then if we look at that level in between, so we get the plants who want the money, we have the front line people who don't know how to do it, we have the issue of program infrastructure and government regulations and what's in place to assure this. And here's what I take as a really telling example of this. In 2011, NCQA added a mental health condition to its um, a requirements for level three um, uh, patient-centered medical home status. Although it turns out it's not a requirement, it's optional. And what it is, is to follow the United States Preventive Services Task Force recommendations for depression, which are, you know, if you have the resources lying around to treat depression, you ought to screen for it. That's what the recommendations are of the U.S. Service Preventive Task Force. And so that optional recommendation is embedded in the patient said medical home as an optional uh, requirement. So, oh my God, if we go back then to think about deinstitutionalization and think about how that turned out, what are uh, some of the markers? I think it's actually a more nuanced story than just the word, which, you know, we hear the word and we see the Time Magazine story, we hear the, the, the media griping about this, the people that, are, um, that, that got lost. I think the story is actually a little more nuanced. Uh, although in some ways it's not great. First, if you take the worst case side effects or failures of deinstitutionalization, after a whole bunch of debate about it and, uh, and research, uh, Stephen Jenks, Jenks concluded that homelessness was actually due to not enough housing. <laughs> it wasn't deinstitutionalization that caused it, although we have to acknowledge that half the people among the chronically homeless are our people. So that's one worst case example. Certainly another is uh, incarceration. You know, everybody knows that the LA County Jail or Rikers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's an interesting one too. It turns out that since the beginning of, I don't know, the time that anybody has grabbed this, the percentage of people with serious mental illness in prisons has remained the same. But when you go out and lock up another million and a half people, they're going to get a lot of people, it turns out in the same proportion, who have uh, a mental illness. So once again, the purported failure is not exactly what it appeared to, uh, appeared to be. 
And then the third thing for me that sort of confuses this frame is something that uh, I heard for the first time by one of my mentors, Bob Oaken, when he was commissioner of Massachusetts, who used to say, and I just thought this was so true and so simple and so profound, that he had never in conversation encountered somebody who had been in a state hospital who got out who wanted to go back. It turns out that we in America value freedom pretty deeply. So deinstitutionalization was this funny mixture of, um, of, of things. And then one of the other questions for all of us who are engaged in trying to provide these services is how has the community mental health infrastructure evolved over this 40, 50 years? Well, look around. 3,000 people at this conference, you know? Uh, fresh faces as well as grizzled ones. So somehow, our infrastructure, despite how problematic it's been, has survived and thrived. It led me to think about a different angle on this question, which is to say, what are those circumstances under which community mental health thrive? And it's not that we haven't faced tough times, that we haven't faced budget cuts, that we haven't faced uh, managed care, and we're always bitching, frankly, about you know something like that that has just happened. But I stood and thought for a while, this is what I'm about to say is not evidence-based, but the, the, the places that I know that have thrived, the organizations that have grown, I even went to you know the website, Mental Health Corporations of America, just sort of clicked on it to look at the members and see the, you know, the people that I've known over the years. And I took away from that three or four things that have led people to survive in that game. One of them is leadership. Leadership that is assertive, uh, sometimes a little bit charismatic, uh, always proactive, I think, has been one of the things that has led community mental health to thrive. A second, it seems to me, is mission. To remain rooted in that vision, the President Kennedy's vision, in a sense, of a life in the community for everybody, or, you know, Charlie Curry's uh, live, work, learn, a home, a date, uh, home, a job, and a date on the weekend, whatever those values are, places that have been successful have had that vision solidly all along. But, here's a wrinkle, that vision has evolved over time with reference to circumstances. So, as I think of several organizations, it seems to me a third thing that comes with the evolution of the vision is an entrepreneurial nature with respect to how community needs are met. So I'm, I'm, I'm channeling, for example, Nelson Burns at Home Professional Services in Ravenna, Ohio, who, as part of their business model, decentralized um, profit and loss responsibility to program directors. And basically he said, you go look for um, successes. The corporation is willing to invest a small amount in that. It's got to be central to our mission. You're responsible for making it happen, but essentially a game-sharing decentralization of entrepreneurial responsibility that seems to me is the third uh, ingredient. And the fourth ingredient of places that have thrived is operational confidence. You know, being able to pay the bills, um, uh, getting people in, um, getting them back in, keeping staff trained and motivated, the stuff that we don't like to talk to so much, but interestingly, with the National Council, with MTM services, with a lot of other things, is now firmly in the mainstream because we've come to realize, I think, that we can't survive without that operational uh, capacity. So then the question is, if we put these two ideas together, uh, where does it lead us? Will this process of integration turn out like the institutionalization? And I think the answer is kind of sort of yes in the following ways. The drivers are still in the mainstream. You know, the drivers are not with us. So the extent to which anybody is hoping or expecting that like me or some other mental health commissioner or Pam Hyde or whatever is going to protect us, you, our clients from all that, get over that. So the power uh, is still uh, centered in the mainstream, not really uh, with us. And the other thing is that, by and large, people are going to prefer services to the mainstream. And I think this is only going to accelerate um, uh, over time. And that's a powerful force that will, uh, that will continue. You know, so for the leaders among us who are trying to set up the environment to make this happen, you know, skill and a little bit of cunning 
uh, can still buy us some time, they can still buy us some arrangements. But I think at the end of the day, the story of integration is going to be like the story of community mental health in that its successes and failures are going to turn to the people who make it happen or don't in their communities. Therefore, the real answer to this question for me is, will integration turn out like the institutionalization? Probably yes. There'll be notorious failures. There'll be quiet successes. There'll be people whose lives are better because of it. There'll be organizations that fail because they didn't pay attention to the bottom line. Their mission stayed the same. Now, here's another theory of mine, that if you look at original community mental health centers, I bet the ones that were hospital-based haven't done as well over time. I have no empirical data to back this up. Maybe somebody knows. I think if that's the case, it's because of the centrality of mission. It wasn't exactly central to the mission the way it was for community agencies. So we'll see how this uh, evolves. But I think this is going to turn out like the institutionalization, better for consumers, lots of stories all over the place. And the real answer is going to be in every community and every community agency that follows through on this opportunity, leads with passion, focuses on operational competence, find ways to be entrepreneurial with, for example, those mainstream people who desperately need our help even though they don't know it yet. And therefore, the future is really in our hands, in your hands. Good luck. <laughs>